Human beings have always been a restless species. Making their way from mountain to plain, valley to valley, from one corner of the planet to another, in search of better hunting, greener pastures, someone else's cattle, richer ores, more water, wealth, a chance to get into fight, freedom, an opportunity to exploit other people, or any of dozens of other goals that have inspired individuals, families, tribes, or whole nations to pack up and move. Although this nomadic spirit has characterized life in most ages, rarely has it become more evident or more consequential for developing civilizations than during the era that began early in the second millennium BCE. On the great Eurasian landmass, two major groups of people were on the move during this period. At the time, they were not identified as two groups, simply as many different tribes, each with its own name. Much later, scholars would sort them out by language characteristics, which probably indicated racial relationships as well, calling one group Indo-European speakers and the other Semitic speakers. In their own day, to the already settled peoples whose land they invaded or infiltrated, they were probably known by whatever local epithet approximated a mix of contempt, fear, and enmity. In the later age, the Greeks would pack the same emotions into a word they coined for foreign-speaking strangers, barbarians. Neither the Indo-Europeans nor the Semites left any obvious clues as to why so many of them spilled out of their homelands into new regions during this era. Migrating was not a novelty to either group. Each had been finding new places to roam or settle as far back as the beginning of the 3rd millennium BCE, although not in such numbers as now. Both had the same general impetus for seeking more amenable environments. Indo-Europeans came from the harsh, semi-arid Eurasian steppes, and Semites from somewhere in the deserts of Arabia and North Africa. Both possessed the means of mobility that encouraged migration, horses for the Indo-Europeans, asses and camels for the Semitic peoples. But just why the trickles of population movement swelled to a flood would remain a mystery. Perhaps a disastrous drought on the steppes forced Indo-Europeans to seek fresh grass for their cattle. Maybe a long string of bountiful years in normally marginal desert lands had inspired an increase of Semitic population, which then needed new places to support itself. Or perhaps tougher people simply moved in and bumped the Semitic or Indo-European groups out of their territories, setting off a chain reaction like billiard balls clicking one another into motion on a blaze-covered table. Whatever the reason, they moved, and from about 1500 to 600 BCE, few civilized parts of the world failed to feel the tremors that resulted. Probably only in South and Middle America were their advanced civilizations so remote that they were not influenced by the migrations of the Indo-Europeans or Semites. There, the shove-in culture in the Andes region and that of the Olmecs in Mesoamerica achieved high levels of artistic and organizational refinement undisturbed by the momentous changes taking place on the other side of the world. Even far up northern China, home of a long-established civilization that grew and flourished during this period, despite the violent overflows of two successive ruling dynasties, probably was indirectly affected. The Chinese had to contend with roving barbarians on their own borders, barbarians who may well have been on the prowl because they had been bumped by other peoples who had been jostled in turn by Indo-Europeans. At the European end of the land mass, migrations of the people from the steppes made a much deeper impression in the shape of the world. Indo-Europeans, who would come to be known as Mycenaeans, moved into Greece and created a dazzling Aegean civilization that replaced the lost world of the Minoans. They were followed to the region by other Indo-Europeans, whose settlements would become the spawning grounds of classical Greek culture. To the north and west, Indo-European peoples... Celts and Germans, Balts and Slavs among them, were to penetrate almost every inhabitable area of the European continent and across the waters into Britain and other offshore lands. Some who settled in the Italian peninsula, most notably a people called the Latins, would eventually eclipse the Etruscans, whose civilization was one of the crowning glories of its age, by building an even greater civilization for a later era. Rome 
other Indo-Europeans, among them a people who would be called the Hittites, came from the steppes to Anatolia, the mountainous land protruding between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea, like the head of a huge rhinoceros standing in Asia and glowering at Europe across a narrow stretch of water. In those mountains, the Hittites would found a mighty empire. Others went from the steppes to the Iranian plateau, and from there, some groups were thought to have trekked east over the Hindu Kush mountains into northern India. But for all those sweeping, large-scale shifts of people across the breadth of Europe and into South Asia, nowhere were the effects of moving populations more visible or more violent than the relatively small region that encompassed the Middle Eastern birthplace of civilization, Mesopotamia, the adjacent lands among Mediterranean's eastern shore, later known as Syria and Palestine. In this area resided tribes and nations that had been fighting territorial battles for centuries. Here, too, were storied cities, large and rich and tempting enough to lure ravening armies from afar and set small kings to dreaming about large empires. Here were prized Mediterranean ports and overland trade routes that could provide untold wealth for those who seized control of them. And here, finally, was where Indo-Europeans pushing down from the north collided not only with settled populations, but also with Semitic people thrusting in from the south and west. Most of the established inhabitants of the region were Semitic, among them the Assyrians, who had first wandered in from the desert and settled along the Tigris River in northern Mesopotamia around the beginning of the 4th millennium BCE. The constant hostility and conflict that marked relationships among local tribes was exasperated in this period by the pressure of more recently arrived Semites including Chaldeans, Armenians, Phoenicians, and Hebrews, who were trying to carve out territories for themselves in the crowded neighborhood. To this bed of continually fanned coals were added into European interlopers encroaching from the north and that old power Egypt reaching up from the south in an attempt to maintain its traditional homogeny of the region. The result was a furnace roaring hotly enough to melt old empires and cultures and to forge new ones. By around 1700 BCE, the ambitious people who would be known as the Hittites had drifted out of the Eurasian hinterland and settled in Anatolia. There, over the course of the next three centuries, they gradually imposed their rule as a royal elite over the inhabitants, who called their land Hatti, from which came the name Hittites. There, as well, among the bleak snow-clad mountains, they established their capital of Hattusha, the storm-swept citadel that stood on a plateau 3,000 feet above sea level. The Hittites were short, stocky people with hawk-like noses, whose men, commonly bearded, wore earrings and frequently arranged their long hair and pigtails so thick that the purpose seemed to have been to protect the neck in battle. Women and men alike dressed themselves in tunics, shoes with pointed turned-up toes and, when the weather demanded it, long robes made of wool. Their culture was notable for its energy and adaptability. They shared many of their gods with other Indo-Europeans, and although the Hittites inscribed monuments with their own hieroglyphs, they enthusiastically adopted the cuneiform writing of the Babylonians, using it to record voluminous myths, hymns, royal edicts, and records of state. Yet the Hittites were also impressive innovators. Their art was highly imaginative, they promulgated a remarkably humane code of law, and they were pioneers in the craft of diplomacy, generally choosing to extend their domain through negotiation and treaty rather than by force of arms. Within the velvet glove, however, was a heavy fist, strengthened by fiercely valiant Hittite warriors and a mechanical innovation. The typical battle chariot of the day was far different from the clumsy vehicle that had been employed by the Sumerians a millennium before. This new machine, developed by Indo-Europeans for steppe warfare and quickly adopted by Semitic armies, boasted slim, racy lines. In place of heavy, solid wooden wheels were spoked wheels, light but strong. With the axle, positioned well to the rear, the chariot was highly maneuverable, capable of snapping round sharp turns without toppling over. Drawn by horses specially bred and schooled for combat instead of the scarcely trained onagers used by the Sumerians, 
the new chariot could charge into battle at high speed. The innovative yoke and harness system also prevented the dilemma of asphyxiation of the horses inherent in the old Sumerian design. The Tittites had made some improvements of their own, whereas most other battle chariots carried two warriors, a driver and an archer. The larger, heavier Hittite vehicle carried three, driver, a spearman, and a shield-bearer. What the Hittites lost in speed and maneuverability, they more than gained in shock value of massed chariot charges, particularly against enemy flanks. Moreover, because Hittite crews carried both offensive and defensive weapons, they were far better equipped for close-in fighting than the occupants of smaller, faster chariots, who usually showered the enemy with arrows from a prudent distance. Despite such an advantage, the Hittite rise to imperial power was a twisting, erratic climb. An early king known as Moshuli I marshaled a large army and marched it 500 miles down the Euphrates River, where he successfully stormed Babylon but he immediately turned round and marched back to Hattusha, possibly because of reports from home of unrest within his own family. He was assassinated by a brother-in-law upon his return. His conquest of Babylon had little advantage for his own nation. It had merely opened the way for a successful takeover there by other Indo-Europeans, Kassites who had migrated into Babylonia from the western plateau of Iran. The Hittites, preoccupied with palace intrigues, royal murders, and usurpations, remained in the shadows of their mountain fastness for more than two centuries, until 1372 BCE when sure-handed administrator, diplomat, and warrior named Shupulima became king. Upon ascending the throne, Shupulima found his land beleaguered by foes on all sides. Especially threatening was the warlike Indo-European tribe called the Mitanni, which ruled a powerful northern Mesopotamian state. Supalima was a patient man. Only after twelve years of strengthening his defenses and reorganizing his army did he turn his hostile intentions to the Mitanni. Supalima's first expedition ended in failure, but in 1366 BCE his Hittite army crossed the Euphrates and marched southward to attack the enemy from the rear. Surprised and cut off from his allies, the Mitanni king fled was subsequently put to death by disgusted members of his own court. The Mitanni became Hittite vassals. The victorious Supuolima then recrossed the Euphrates into Syria, where he conquered eight small kingdoms. Among them was the city-state of Kadesh, whose ruler was brave and foolish enough to challenge the Hittites in battle. He was easily vanquished. By 1353 BCE, the Hittite Empire was rivaled in size and power only by Egypt, and in that year, Supolima received an astonishing message from Egypt's young queen, Akasanaman, the widow of Tutankhamun, who recently died at the age of 18. My husband has died, and I have no sons, she wrote plaintively. They say about you that you have many sons. If you would send me one of your sons, you could become my husband. The Egyptian, who lacked political support within her own country, probably wanted the security that a Hittite prince's army could provide. Such a marriage might have altered the course of international politics in the region for decades to come. However, suspecting Tetri, Supolima cautiously dispatched his emissary to find out, as his chronicles put it, what truth there was in the matter with the woman. The emissary apparently was not very tactful. The queen replied that she was insulted at having her motives questioned. Nevertheless, she did renew and even strengthen her offer. If Supolima would send her a son, then he would be my husband and king in the country of Egypt. Still, the Hittite monarch delayed, dragging out the negotiations for almost a year until, satisfied at last, he sent a son to accept the hand of the Egyptian queen. But it was too late. By then, an Egyptian courtier priest named I had preempted Akasanaman's throne. Upon his arrival in the land of the Nile, the unfortunate Hittite prince was seized and put to death. But the Hittite realm continued to prosper and expand until by the time Supalima perished of a pestilence in 1334 BCE, it encompassed 260,000 square miles, stretching from the Aegean Sea south to the mountains of Lebanon, east to the headwaters of the Euphrates. And Hittite political, religious, legal, and military institutions were firmly established in a manner that befitted 
one of the mightiest empires in the world. Hittite power was founded on military prowess, which in turn was based on Hittite chariots. The chariots needed constant maintenance, and both the warriors who manned them and the horses that drew them required rigorous training. In fact, good war horses were considered more valuable than men. The Hittites used a military manual that set forth in meticulous detail a schedule for equine care and training, when to wash a horse and when to rub it with oil, when to cover the animal with a blanket, how to prepare the horse's feed, and how to exercise the beast each day. So much did Hittites rely on the chariot that the vehicle, in sense, shaped their society. There evolved a powerful class of charioteers whose aristocratic leaders, in order that they might devote full time to their belligerent calling, were awarded estates by the king. The result was a type of feudal system. In the pinnacle stood the monarch or great king. He was at once head of state, commander-in-chief of the army, which he was fully expected to lead into the field, the supreme judicial authority, the master of his own household, right down to such details as the straining of the royal water. Palace discipline was rigorous. On one occasion, a servant named Zulia was executed permitting a hare to appear in the king's pitcher. Taking precedence over all else were the ruler's obligations as a high priest. Religious duties were so important that Hittite kings occasionally were compelled to suspend military operations mid-campaign so that they could preside over religious observances at home. Whenever the Hittites suffered a reverse in war, it was taken as a sure sign that they had somehow displeased one or more of their diverse collection of gods. At such moments of crisis, the king would repair to the roof of his palace, enter a prayerful discourse with the deity over two tables laden with sacrificial bread. I have taken refuge with the storm god, the monarch would intone. Save my life, walk on my right hand, team up with me as a bull to draw the wagon. The storm god thus petitioned was Teshub, often depicted clutching a lightning bolt as he rushed about the mountaintops in a chariot drawn by two sacred bulls, Shuri and Huri. He was chief of the Hittite pantheon, a rowdy, even earthy lot, endowed with all manner of human frailty. They feuded among themselves, they lied and cheated, they lusted and were consumed by jealousies. Yet, if their gods were exceedingly unruly, the Hittites themselves were of notably lawful mind. Although all legal authority stemmed from the king, judicial responsibility was designated to local elders, along with provincial military commanders who, as the king representatives, had strict orders to do what is just. Hittite law was remarkably free of the manipulative cruelties of the earlier Babylonian code or those of the later Assyrian Empire. To be sure, defiance of the king's authority meant with draconian punishment. The offenders' homes were made into a heap of rubble and the criminals themselves stoned to death, along with all the members of their families. Other than that, death penalty was mandatory only for bestiality and rape, where the odd distinction was made between seizing a married woman in the mountains which was a capital crime, and attacking her in her house. In the latter case, if the woman could not be heard crying out for help, she would be put to death, apparently on the theory that she had willingly committed adultery. The basic principle of Hittite law was one of restitution instead of retribution. For example, arsonists were required to replace the property they burned. Even murderers could go free after enumerating their victims' heirs generally payment of silver, slaves, land, or a house, along with burial costs. For the Hittites, the rule of law extended even to foreign relations, and their empire was in fact a web of states bound together by treaties usually inscribed on tablets of gold, silver, or iron, whose legal force was strengthened by the religious belief of this intensely religious people. A treaty, for instance, typically called down an awful curse upon the signatory who failed to meet its provisions. One such agreement with a neighboring king named Dupiteshub said that if he did not live up to its terms, may these divine oaths destroy Dupiteshub, his wife, his son, his grandson, his house, his city, his land, and everything that belongs to him. As witnesses, the names of no fewer than 80 gods and goddesses were inscribed. Hittite chariots were always ready to roll against states that declined to accede to the empire's diplomatic demands. 
The usual excuse for an attack was the nation was harboring Hittite fugitives. In that vein, Mashuli II wrote to the king of nearby Aswa in Anatolia, My subjects who went over to you, when I demanded them back from you, you did not restore them to me, and you called me a child and made light of me. Up then, let us fight, and let the storm god, my lord, decide our case. Azara paid dearly for its recaltrance. Its king was slain, and, as Masuli II wrote, the total of the civilian captives that I, my majesty, brought back to the royal palace was altogether 66,000. When Mashuli II died in 1306 BCE, he left his son, Muatali, an empire strong in its core and buffered by vassal states whose rulers were obligated to answer Hittite call to arms. Only one cloud loomed on the horizon. To the south, resurgent Egyptian forces were preparing to challenge Hittite control over Syria. The Hittite frontier in Syria lay on the Orontes River at Kadesh, which Matuli's grandfather, Supu Alima, had seized almost as an afterthought as campaign against Mitanni. And it was toward Kadesh that Ramses II, Egypt's aggressive young pharaoh, marched with four divisions of his 20,000-man army in the spring of 1285 BCE. But Mu'atali had warning and more than enough time to mobilize. An Egyptian chronicler of the engagement related that Mu'atali had gathered together all the countries from the ends of the sea to the land of Hatti. He started out with an army estimated at nearly 17,000 men, including no fewer than 2,500 chariots with their three-man crews. A guileful commander, Mu'atali concealed his soldiers just beyond the city of Kadesh, then sent into the Egyptian camp two spies who, pretending to be deserters, told the pharaoh the Hittite army was still lingering far to the north in Aleppo. Spies must have been convincing because Ramses accepted the tale. With most of his army strung out far behind him, he advanced on Kadesh at the head of a single division, and Mu'atali, who had wheeled his chariots into position south of the city, forded the Orontes River and savagely attacked the Egyptian division, which broke and fled. Ramses was rescued from defeat by a timely arrival of a regiment of allies, the Canaanites, who held the field until other divisions of the Egyptian army came up. The Hittites finally withdrew behind the fortification of Kadesh. Although both sides later claimed victory, it was the Egyptians who shortly headed for home, leaving Mu'atali and his Hittites in possession of Kadesh and Syria. For about 15 years, the Hittites and Egyptians were content to glower at each other from within their respective imperial boundaries, the Hittites holding general homogeny over Syria while Egypt exercised power in Palestine. If anything, the Hittites were more disturbed by the rising power of the Syrians, their troublesome neighbors in Upper Mesopotamia, than by the Egyptians. At one point, Assyria's ruler had the temerity to write to a Hittite monarch named Hattusholi calling himself the great king and addressing the Hittite as brother. Had to surely quickly put the upstart in his place. Were you and I perhaps born of the same mother? He haughtily replied. Do not write about brotherhood and great kingship to me. As it happened, Egypt was also fretful about Assyrian ambitions, and was almost certainly in their mutual perception of the threat that the two old foes decided to put their differences aside. In the year 1269 BCE, Ramses II and Hattusholi concluded a treaty binding their two nations to refrain from warring against each other and to fight as allies should they be subjected to aggression by another people. Both powers would faithfully observe the agreement. Two years after it was made, Ramses II took a Hittite princess as his bride. Yet the era of the Hittites was waning. After Hattusholi came a number of nondescript kings, and near the end of the 13th century BCE, monarchical authority was rapidly decaying. Observed a scribe of that period. His Majesty, my lord, found the inhabitants of Hatti to be in revolt. Thus weakened, the empire was helpless against the onslaught of a new wave of invaders, seafarers who appeared in the eastern Mediterranean in the late 13th century. Their origins are not certain and they would be known by the name the Egyptians gave them, the Sea Peoples. They were apparently an alliance of several groups, possibly including Phrygians, Indo-Europeans from the west coast of the Black Sea, 
who would occupy Anatolia after the Hittites disappeared. Whoever they were and wherever they came from, the attackers obliterated the Hittite world, reducing Hattusha to ashes, smashing stone sculptures, slaughtering much of the population, and driving the rest into exile. And so, in 1200 BCE, the Hittite Empire vanished, creating a power vacuum in the Middle East, was destined to be filled by the Hittites' rivals and neighbors, the Assyrians. Thank you.